Nudgy Gurge in BTN. When you hear broom, what do you think of? Camels? Pals. Camel meat! Did you know broom gets over 100,000 visitors each year? And they travel from as far as Siberia. Not people, silly. Shorebirds. Why do shorebirds come to broom? One of the reasons is because of the huge tides, and I'm talking from 1 metre to 11 metres high. Now you see the water? Now you don't. This extraordinary tidal movement over the mudflats creates a rich feeding ground for the shorebirds. They eat creatures out of the mud. Shorebirds travel thousands of kilometres between their breeding grounds, some flying six days straight. That's right, no stopping at a servo to refuel or get some snacks. What happens if they don't get enough food? They fall out of the sky and die. That's exactly why some of these birds are becoming critically endangered. Here we are at the Broom Bird Observatory. Twitchers and bird watchers visit from all over the world to observe the feeding habits, behaviour and conservation possibilities of these spectacular birds. Ben, who is a warden out here, visited our school recently, so we took the opportunity to ask them all about shorebirds. What birds are the most endangered in Broome? Around Broome, the most endangered shorebirds are things like this eastern curlew here, as well as things like the red knot, the bar-tailed godwit and the curlew sandpiper. And the reasons these birds are endangered is mostly due to mudflat loss and habitat loss in the Yellow Sea where they visit on their migration. What are shorebirds prey? They feed on different benthic invertebrates, different things that live in the mudflats like worms, shrimps, bivalves, crabs, and the different kinds of beaks they have uh, dictate which kind of things they feed on in the mudflat. Natural predators in somewhere like Broome and Roebuck Bay would be falcons and feral cats. As they move north on their migration, once they get to their breeding grounds across the Arctic, the Arctic fox might take young shorebirds, eggs, and even adults if it gets near enough. Things we can do to help the eastern curlew here uh, in Roebuck Bay, we really want to limit disturbance. So we want to allow these birds to rest and preserve all the energy they need for migration, which means not letting dogs chase them up and down the beach. They're not disturbed by drones or boats or people walking too near. In the Yellow Sea, we need to help limit mudflat loss. And in Siberia, one of the threats facing shorebirds is climate change. This spot right here is where Theta Kimberley helped the local indigenous rangers boat directed a huge production with huge profits to educate our community why it's so important to help these birds. Our school was so lucky to be involved. We made puppets and learned original songs made by local musicians. The story followed Curtis the Curlew's life journey and the challenges he faces along the way. The empty, lit up mudflats provided a stunning stage for this incredible show. In a flock of shorebirds, it can look anything like this, where there might be a few hundred to a few thousand. During the wet season, when Roebuck Bay has over 100,000 shorebirds in the bay, you might have one flock with 20,000 birds in it, which is pretty significant. There's nowhere else in Australia with such big numbers. So the shorebirds all leave throughout February, March and April, but different species leave at different times. When they gather on the beach like this picture here, it's all mixed together, a mixed flock of shorebirds. But when they depart, they go in species-specific flocks. So all the bar-tailed godwits will leave together, all the eastern curlew will leave together, and they migrate different species at different times. It's just some built-in sense which drives them north. When they're coming back, part of it follow dad and then have to fly on their own. And no one knows exactly how the shorebirds know where to go. There's different ideas, like some might use the stars to navigate. They have magnets in their heads which point them in the right direction, but no one knows for sure exactly where they know where to go. So shorebirds, despite flying such massive distances each year, cannot glide or soar. They literally have to flap their wings for the entire journey, which leads to enormous energy demands, but they have all kinds of adaptations to help them with those flights. Some of these birds will fly for over a week, non-stop, day and night. So to be able to rest and sleep, they shut down half their brain at a time whilst continuing to fly. How mm -hmm. big do they usually get to go migrate? 
Some birds, like the red knot here, they will more than double their body weight before they take off on migration. In June 2021, Millie, a black kite, fell out of her nest and was found by a local bird watcher. She was placed into the care of the Native Animal Rescue and Han Reared. Upon release, Millie visited her carers for support feeding, but her visits became less frequent and by March 2022, Millie was totally independent for survival and had a documented range of 100 kilometres. On a stormy wet season day, Millie found herself seeking shelter on a cruise ship bound for Bali. Despite many efforts and petitions to get Millie returned home, the Department of Agriculture said that bringing Millie back to Broome will be a huge risk. Millie is now in a bird park in Bali with no hope of ever getting released. Thousands of shorebirds are allowed to migrate each year. Why is it so hard for Millie to come home? Thanks for watching. Next time you hear Broome, I hope you think of Shorebird! Dahlia!